Yeah, good, mate. Yourself? Yeah, excellent. I, I believe we've got um, Barrup on the line with us today. Barrup um, is now in Argentina. He's an ex-Aussie uh, from West mm-hmm. Australia. Mate, so good you could come along and um, pop in and visit us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the invite. Um, it's going to be great to have a chat with you guys. Yeah. So, mate, uh, look, before we get started, um, can you give us a bit of a give us a background of, of yourself and, you know, how you got into trading, that sort of stuff? Yep, yep. Um, so, yeah, I was born born in Australia and uh, I used to be in the military, actually, for about seven years. And I left that in 2017 and was trying to decide, uh, you know, what I, what I wanted to do in life and uh, whether I liked having a boss anymore or working for someone else. And so I was looking at uh, in at different things and uh, I came across Forex trading. And so since then I've basically been learning um, for the last three or so, three or so years. And uh, yeah, it's been like a part of a journey for financial independence and learning about, uh, you know, personal finance, which is something that I wasn't really looking at yeah. Uh, when I was in the military, you know, I really had no idea about <laughs> the way the monetary system works or, or anything like that. So, uh, yeah, learning learning to trade and uh, learning Forex has been a, a part of that journey for me. Gotcha, mate. And is this, um, have, you, you've obviously quite experienced in um, algorithm development, is that right? Yeah, so I started doing manually uh, manual trading uh, when I first started and, and learning and learning price action and everything. And then I came across MetaTrader 4 and MQL4 and just the idea of automation uh, really excited me. Uh, back in 2000 and f- oh no, 2006 and seven, I actually did a diploma of IT in software design and development. And during my time in the military, we used automation and coding for lots of things like PowerShell and um, VB macros and uh, coding routers and switches and stuff. And so coding kind of is natural to me and um, automation, automating a system <laughs> is what yeah. is what I prefer. And yeah, I, I had all those struggles with, uh, with manual trading, with discretion and going, you know, is this a, is this a double bottom or is this not a double bottom? And I just, <laughs> you know. For me, I, for I, me I, this story, man. <laughs> Uh, I just prefer the, you know, a chronological, uh, logical sequence of events, you know, if then do this um, and prefer coding. So I, I started full time uh, algorithmic trading and learning uh, MQL4, which is good because it's kind of like C++, which is uh, what I already knew. And so that's what I've been focusing on uh, in the recent years. Mm-hmm. Fred, mate, have you got anything to say to Barrett? Uh, obviously, Fred's down your line in the programmatic space. Yeah, I had the same issues. I started discretionary trading and I sucked at it. So <coughs> for me, the only way to do it was to automate it. And, um, and yeah, I had a, a bit of a programming background, but not as intense as yours by the sound of it. So it's all self-taught pretty much. But, um, yeah, I've, I've enjoyed the journey. It's, it's been ongoing now for 10 years or thereabouts and probably... Nine of those years has been in the algo space. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. I think we're like mind in that sense that there's so much power in in the algos, and uh, and but it, it also leads you down the path of, of making assumptions and getting caught up in stuff. And you probably no doubt run a whole bunch of EAs that look fantastic in backtest and then just fall on their ass when 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 trading live. So all that <laughs> yeah. stuff's part part of the learning curve. So yeah, welcome. And um, yeah, I share I share your view of the world. Yeah. <laughs> like mine, actually, it's uh, your background in the military too would make you very systems orientated. I, I suppose uh, we all out here are very systems orientated. That that's the only way we we think we can crack crack this beast. So um, yeah. So look, um, what we've been doing so far um, as as us three are aware is um, we've been heavily testing four different types of trend following system um, 
two being of a breakout technique and um, two others being of a, a more a short, short-term short nature trend following system. So the four systems um, are described in our prior podcasts. And um, so uh, we've so far been testing across a universe of around about uh, 20 markets, but um, at the moment we've tested up to about 14 to 16 of them using those four different variations of system and we're now at the stage of portfolio compilation and um, I thought what we'd do is we'd go over um, some of the results we're getting at, at a raw portfolio level so we could have some discussions about uh, where to go from here um, and um, so look I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully um, you should be able to well, while, while you're getting that up, Rich, um, yeah. question, question to Barrett. You've sort of been dragged into this process by our our, our guiding light, if you like. But does it, does it make sense to you? Have you have you come? Have you sort of followed what we're trying to do and understand it, and or has it become a pain to do? Or, or what are your thoughts about what we're trying to do? It's made uh, the most sense out of. Pretty much anything I've done uh, so far with with algorithmic trading, you know, I'm kind of it's you know been a journey for me, um, learning and trying to figure out where I want to where I want to go with it. And uh, since coming across systematic diversified trend following, I think that is the space uh, that I really want to get into and that I'm I'm really excited about. And yeah, the process and the system you guys are using makes 100% sense to me. I, I agree with it completely. And I think um, it's really what I've been looking for, uh, you know, during during my trading journey, trying to, you know, you have mean reversion and you, there's a uh, system portfolio compilation that not a lot of people address or risk management on the portfolio level. And uh, you guys seem to be taking care of everything. So... Yeah, it makes makes perfect sense to me. Well, it does to yeah. us too, but it's it's great to hear it from someone that's coming in from the outside, and especially with the with the trend following and the um, visualizing the the return stream against the um, the price chart as well to make sure that it makes logical sense that the. Yeah. You know, you're not making profits when you should be making profits. You know, generally most people just hit auto optimize on their on their MT4 and take the top result. And you know, that's and just did the did the the pair was it profitable? Yeah, and they just throw it into a. <laughs> but, uh, a We've been like, down that path before as well. <laughs> it's not a like it makes logical sense. Uh, like it's yeah. an, an extra step that um not a lot of people take to like to verify that the results uh make money and that they they should be making money at the same time yeah uh, um it was actually nick Raj that um made us turn course there in one of his early podcasts he did quite a few years ago where he was talking about um, um tying your system performance to the market condition and um, he, he made very logical sense when he was saying, if your equity curve is rising during an unfavourable market condition, that's a dead set sign you've got a curve fit scenario. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's we took heed of that and that, that's where we started looking at this visualisation approach, um, which I think makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, we're, we're happy with where we, we're going. I suppose the, the problems we're coming to now is we're, we're, we're trying to make these solutions as data-driven as possible um, because even in the selection of markets, the tendency for many people is to assume that um, by selecting markets in different asset classes, they're getting non-correlated relationships. But mm. what we are saying is that, well, look, that's an assumption and um, the only way you're going to be able to validate that is basically letting your system um, pick the non-correlated suites from the the, the, the long-term data that's presented to it. Um, we think that's a much more logical conclusion than just a, a broad assumption. 
Um, so Fred, Fred um, and, and I have been really um, focused um, on this systematic approach to um, eliminating um, as much discretion as we possibly can in any of our decision making processes. And we, we're coming to a good place where we're finding that with a bit of thought and a bit of creativity in the systematic design space, you can always use the data um, in the the process of decision making itself. Um, so, Fred, have you got anything to say on that one? No, not particularly. I, I, yeah, just just keep going, mate. I think the, um, the the fact that we're using logic really rings true for me. I mean, um, the data is the data. There's nothing we can do about that. So, if we use that to make our decisions and make decisions that make sense, then we've got to be coming up with something that uh, at least has got a, a, a ring of truth to it. And then if that actually delivers a profit, then we've got to be on a good thing. And that's that's really what I think you're behind all this. Yeah, yeah. All right, gents, well, look, I'll get onto this, um, I'll get onto this portfolio and um, it, it's going to be quite interactive. Can you see my screen with the, um, um, the chart here, the equity curve. Yep. Yep. So what we have here, this grey line is the S and P total return. Um, so that's including dividends of the S and P five hundred. Uh, we use that as basically a benchmark to then assess our portfolio performance. Yep. And um, on the uh, left hand side of the spreadsheet here, we've got uh, we turn on or turn off each of these individual system results by putting a, a one to turn on that particular system result and you can see that now we've populated the the the, the graph with the result of that one system um, so as we add more systems obviously the equity curve adapts as time goes on so we see that sort of in an interactive way as we're turning on and off instruments here and how it's performing against this benchmark and over here uh, we see the individual um, return streams of the different systems reflecting themselves and this red here is the drawdown of the entire portfolio which is the same as the drawdown which is this um, ochre um, colored drawdown here the p light pink is the S&P 500 um, so Rich, the reason Rich, yeah Rich, sorry Rich, Fred go I was going to say before you move too deeply into it you might just explain where those listings came from on that uh, in that spreadsheet like what does it mean to look at the ATS BO Euro D1? What does that actually represent for people who haven't joined us previously? Okay. They may not understand what we've done to get to this point. All right. So uh, the BO stands for a breakout system using it's a Donkian breakout system, but it has a, a fixed profit target. It, it's got positive skew in general. Um, but uh, there is a profit target assigned to that particular breakout trader. The intent of that strategy is a more short term momentum based strategy that's looking to scalp those major momentum uh, moves. When I say scalp, we're certainly not down in the very short time frames, but I'm talking about scalping on the daily time frame. Um, and we have a, a, a fairly shorter term period average hold, maybe up to 30 days, 50 days, as opposed to the Don, which is the Donkian breakout system, which uses a trailing stop technique. Um, and that um, can have um, a, a, um, a holding period of up to three or four years if you're onto a significant trending condition. But as you can see, um, the Don and the Breakout, these two systems here, are very similar in their design. The only thing that differs between the two is one has a profit target and one doesn't and has a trailing stop. So uh, both systems catch the Breakout, but this uh, Breakout trader here um, is what we regard as a sniper on those momentum moves. And the Donkian is more a, a classic trend following system that breathes and can operate over a very long time frame. The um, MATP and the MATSL are both moving average techniques, trend following techniques using moving average crossovers. Um, the moving average, uh, the MATP uses, like the BO system, a take profit target, and the MA. TSL is the moving average crossover using a trailing stop technique. So effectively, these four techniques are both uh, four different ways of catching a trend 
the dominant contributors to overall profitability are the long-term trend followers, but the addition of these breakout traders and the MACP, which has a fixed profit target, helps to smooth the curve and and gives us um, uh, some sort of low correlated um, benefits uh, to the overall portfolio. So these for the Euro USD uh, and for every single market, we've got these four systems operating. But each system in itself uh, is made up of multiple EAs. And if you want to know more about that, you'll need to go and look at some previous videos. But in essence, the, in this particular example, we're using five EAs per strategy. Yes, so 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. You can understand how we've got a lot of systems here all operating with different uh, value sets. Um, and those value sets are derived during our optimization process uh, which um, is a very long-term optimization process. Uh, the reason we do, and we've got a very good discussion point, which we'll discuss later on in this podcast tonight, where we can see um, what we mean by um, uh, needing a long-term optimization set to capture a broad range of market conditions. Um, we'll get to that with um, crude oil, which is a very interesting one. But, the other thing, the other thing yep. Rich, you might point out is your time scale on your graph. I can't really see it, but what, what range are we looking at there? So the, the test range is between 1985, first of the first 1985, up to um, the current day. So as you can see with the S&P, this is where it's currently sitting on. A, so this is a month by month, um, a basic uh, a month by month valuation or mark to market valuation of the S and P and our portfolio uh, from 1985 up to current day. So the S and P currently we've had this big drop and it's sitting um, it's around about 22 percent down uh, for the month. Uh, the S and P results over that time period from 1985 up to the current day. Um, so up to the 26th of the 3rd, 2020, these are the results for the S&P. You can see that um, it's had a compound annual growth rate from 1985 on $100,000 start of 9.52% per annum. Its worst drawdown on a monthly basis was 50.95%, which was here um, in 2008 with the GFC. But um, it's had some pretty wicked drawdowns in the past as well, 2002 with the tech bubble. And back in 1987, as we know, uh, with, the, with the crash there. Um, but um, this is where we are now. And our drawdown is at around about 22% for the um, S&P. Um, we don't know where this is going to go. It could go anywhere, but um, that's where it's currently sitting. And uh, this is, uh, so as at the moment, this um, here, which is a trend combo, is the results of these four systems being turned on. So this is one market, the Euro USD, and this is the equity curve of that one market with a $100,000 start. Now, what you'll see is uh, what we're looking at is as we build our diversification across systems and across markets, this risk-adjusted return or the MA relationship improves. So at the moment, you can see the uh, the four systems that are turned on for the Euro USD is generating a MA ratio of 0.28, which produces a compound annual growth rate of 7.9%, with a maximum drawdown over the entire period of 28%. Now, it's higher than the MA ratio. This single system, Euro USD, with four different system variations, um, is already on a risk-adjusted basis outperforming the um, S&P 500. The S&P 500, you can see to get that 9.5% compound annual growth rate, you needed a 50.95% drawdown. So whether you'd have the stomach to tolerate that level of drawdown, I'll leave to you to work out, but um, it starts getting very uncomfortable when you get down to those levels of drawdown, which buy and hold investors um, have obviously been through before, and I'd say not many of them have stuck with it. So, but the good thing is, if they had stuck with the S and P over that entire um, from '85 up to current day with a hundred thousand dollar start, 
the principle of compounding on that return stream for the S&P, they'd be sitting on 2.7 million with no additional inputs from that $100,000 start um, at current day. Now, what I want to show you is that as we get further diversification by turning on more and more of these, watch visually how this drawdown of the composite portfolio improves and watch how the compound annual growth rate of the portfolio improves as we increase the number of, of systems and markets. Also look at that Ma ratio and how that improves. So here we go. Just Rich, quite a, before you yep, do, yep. Um, just a note to Barrett, uh, Richard likes to talk. It's hard to break in occasionally, but it'd be <laughs> nice, to, nice to hear from our guest speaker occasionally. So please feel free to jump in. I've heard on the previous podcast, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just just hit me over the head with a hammer. Here we go. I'll, I'll start doing it. So you can now see that uh, progressively, the drawdown is changing shape of the um, the overall portfolio. We've got a nasty drawdown at the moment sitting here, at this point here, at the moment for the overall portfolio, but it's not as aggressive as the drawdowns of the S&P. But this should flatten out as we diversify more and also look at our return stream it's progressively lifting. We're pretty excited because at the moment now we've got a, a composite return stream which is clearly outperforming the S&P, a, a buy and holder. Uh, this is with um, 17 systems effectively turned on at this stage. There's a couple of things we see here. One is that we've got a much smoother equity curve and what that smooth equity curve does is the principles of compounding are improved with a smoother equity curve. So if you could imagine, if suddenly your equity drops by 50% and compounding occurs each month, if it drops 50%, the compounding effect, while it is at those low levels, is very small. But if you've got a consistent line uh, of equity or a consistent growth of equity that doesn't have that significant volatility in its um, overall shape, the principles of compounding can be um, basically enhanced over the course of that return series. So at the moment, now, yep. Rich, go the ahead. other thing you might want to explain, Rich, is um, is what's the account balance like? Is it are we starting with a hundred thousand, or are we starting with a hundred thousand times seventeen instruments? Both of these starting? start. Both of these start with a hundred thousand equity. Full stop. So that hundred thousand is spread across the seventeen. Correct. Yes. We're still starting with a hundred thousand. We're not. We're not doing seventeen hundred thousands worth. It's just one one hundred thousand dollar amount, uh, spread across seventeen systems. And you've chosen a uh, hundred thousand just for simplicity for now. Yes. Uh, we'll, we'll. I'll show you what happens when we lift and decrease this as uh, when we get to the end of this exercise. But I'll just keep on going. Uh, because you, you start seeing the stunning impact of what diversification starts bringing to this table. Look where the uh, the return stream is now compared to the S&P. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn all of these on. Okay, so there we go. So both of these start with $100,000. Look how this outperforms. Now, this is because, well, we've, we've got um, a compound annual growth rate of the series of 12%. The maximum drawdown, which is back here, uh, was 31%. And the MAR ratio is 0.38%. Compared to the, now this is a raw portfolio without any adjustments, just turning the whole thing on. Um, it's significantly outperformed the S&P. Now, the S&P, as we know, is effectively a portfolio of 500 of the top performing um, companies in the US. Um, so that's, a lot of people think it's a diversified portfolio, but as we know, because it's um, concentrated in equities, um, the, um, the correlation breaks down during bear phases where everything turns red. Uh, we, we're long and short with this portfolio here, so we're not a long only portfolio, unlike the S&P, which is particularly advantageous 
in an economy or a future of an economy that is very uncertain. Um, you know, at the moment, the implicit assumption is that things will return back to where it was, but that's not necessarily the case. Japan, for instance, since the 1980s, has been struggling to ever achieve what it once had. Um, who knows what the future brings? But if you are long and short, um, that that um, at least doesn't have that implicit assumption of long only built into it. Mm -hmm. So, as we can see here, uh, we've got a great result uh, for the portfolio as a, as a whole. And um, if we wanted to look at the individual equity contributions for the different systems, as I scroll down here, you can see it. But there's, there's no point for this exercise. Uh, that's just more of the detail. But the principle here is showing you how diversification is achieving this, um, this benefit. And one of, the, one of the things to note is that there might be significant drawdowns in um, individual systems here. And to show you that, this particular system, the MAT SL, had an 83% drawdown over, its, um, over the period here. Now, that on its own would be regarded as a failure. But when it's only part of a comprehensive portfolio, its impact is negligible. So... Um, you can look at some uh, very serious drawdowns. There's a 52% drawdown with the US 500, with the, the Donkian system. There's a 47% drawdown with the pound yen. Um, there's a 66% drawdown with the, um, the crude oil. A um, 61% uh, um, drawdown here again with the crude oil on another system. But the impact of those drawdowns um, at a comprehensive diversified portfolio level will not be reflected in the overall result. And that, that's because our bets are small on each of these individual systems here. And uh, the impact um, is cumulative at the portfolio level. And right now, Rich, you're going long and short on equities or is this long yeah. only? Yes, um, look, at the moment, just for the, this particular model, we are long and short on equities, but Fred, um, you talk about your adjustments you're planning. Yeah, well, when we started this, we thought we'd probably stay in the Forex space, and so we weren't too concerned about long short. Uh, we just let it go wherever it went, and as you're aware, the data mining picks out the, uh, the better performers and puts them together in, in their combinations. But... Um, when Richard started looking at commodities and uh, equities and other bits and pieces, we thought, well, hold the phone, we'd probably need to expand our data horizon. And so the, the next tranche of EAs, which are not far away, will give you the option of going short only, both directions, or long only. And through the iteration process and through the data mining, we end up with uh, some interesting results. Even on a, on a Forex pair, I've noticed occasionally there'll be a long only or a short only slip in as one of the options within the um, within the selection criteria. So um, naturally where we've got um, say the S&P or thereabouts um, we'll probably end up with a lot of long trades but interesting enough we do get a couple of shorts popping up there as well so it's it's an interesting outcome and we'll, we'll have to study that as it comes along. Barrett, I did some preliminary research on the um, on the equities, which was uh, featured in the forum, um, which clearly demonstrated that with equity indices, this is just with the indices, it is definitely worth considering long only. Um, so, mm. but look, with what we're doing with this enhanced EAs, that uh, will, will be the next step of this process is we'll be um, using the data to to make a determination there. So in our optimization, which uh, we've already uh, done in relation to these systems, we'll be adding this long, short or, or combined um, to um, let the data say which one we should use. Um, yeah. So, yep. I think it's, I think it's uh, like, it's great that you, the system is already in place where if you want to switch that on, you, you're not changing the process that you're already following. It's just going, Turning it on, it's going into the optimization process and using the data to determine the result, whether it's eliminating that bias that you might have where, oh, I should only go long on, 
on equities, well, the data will tell you whether you should or you shouldn't be. Yes. Yeah, correct. Yep, very much so. Uh, Rich, look, Rich yep, the other sorry. thing is um, you, don't, you go from 85 through, but the selection process was over a shorter period, was it not? Yes, so our uh, optimization process was from 2000 up to the end of 2019. Uh, we still had a very long optimization process, and I'll show you why we did this. There's a really good example I want to show with the crude. But um, so about half of this is uh, data mined. Oh, well, I, I don't like using that term with this trend following technique. Half of this was optimized over a range from 2000 up to current day. Uh, but the, this full sample test um, is at the outer sample. The full sample goes from 1985 up to current day. Yeah, so the interesting thing there is that um, we've, we've got a half in sample, half out of sample, and the equity curve still heads in the right direction. Yeah. But what we plan to do going forward is to increase our optimization range to commence from 1985 and i'll show you why so what i'm going to do is i'm going to turn off all of the systems apart from crude um so i'll just get okay so having crude oil in the equation you can start seeing where our drawdown goes now the reason for that when you come and look at this is you can see that we have optimized from 2000 up to current day well up to 2019 now of course the optimization is therefore going to select the better options but look at how it fails out of sample here now this really caught me unawares because this is the first time I've seen this because we're using a very long data range for our optimization, but I think we've got to go further because when I look at the chart for crude oil, I'll just bring this over. Uh, I'll just get crude oil up. XTI. All right. So from 2000 i'll just put where that is so from 2000 up to the end of 2019 effectively there this is the optimized zone now you can see the optimization process has had very favorable trending conditions within that zone however where it fell down, have a look at it. So what this tells me is that the market conditions that were prevalent during this phase of optimization were not present during this phase here. So now this is a classic pitfall. Now, no, most of the time, when people optimize, they optimize over two or three years. And this is the case we want to demonstrate in that uh, when they're optimizing over a very short period of time, that is only reflective of those market conditions over that time frame. But when market conditions outside that time frame are significantly different, their systems fall over. Well, we've found that here, even though we've used a 20 year horizon for our optimization. Now, what I'm suggesting is that in this next phase, we actually optimize back to 1985 up to current day. So therefore our optimization will bring in these market conditions, these unfavorable market conditions here, as well as the favorable conditions here. Now, inevitably everything is curve fit um, to a degree, um, but the bad systems are obviously overly curve fit. Um, even in the design of a system, a trend following system, you are curve fitting it because you're saying, I only want to catch trends. Or if you're de designing a mean reverting system, um, I want to catch the, the mean reversion or the, from the maximum excursion. So that they are curve fit. Everything we do is curve fit. And what I'm saying is that, okay, for this next testing phase, let's broaden it up. We need as many different types of market condition as we can get. Guys, what do you think about that general principle? I don't personally like the term curve fit because it's sort of, it's got bad connotations. What, what we're really doing, we're not curve fitting to get an outcome. What we're actually trying to do is map to the market. So when the market 
does a move, we want to try and pick that move up and take advantage of that move. So we're fitting to the market conditions. We're not curve fitting in the traditional sense, which is trying to come up with a um, an equity curve. So I'm just not sure that's the right terminology to use. Barrett, what do you think? Have you looked into uh, why there is such a, a contrast between pre-2000 and post-2000 for crude oil? Look, not, not from a fundamental perspective, no, I haven't. Um, I suppose what I'm, uh, uh, we're trying to eliminate the need for that by using data as a proxy. Um, but what are, you, what are your thoughts there? Um, well, obviously I can't be 100% sure, but I would guess that it's probably to do with uh, shale and the shale revolution uh, in the US in the early 2000s um, and the, the processes that they were able to use to extract oil from shale and the, the process change in the US um, ramped up their production and so that didn't exist prior to the early 2000s. Okay. Well, Which is interesting sense. because yeah. you know, if um, no, <laughs> you know, is the shale industry uh, going to go tits up? Is it going to continue? <laughs> the, other the, same, the other interesting the comment situation. there is if if uh, the shale industry is what's driven the price, you would have thought that the price would come down, and in fact, it went up. So I'm not sure how that correlates. Well, for the first time, I think the first time this week, Canada has got a, a, a I think uh, I was reading tweets that they're at negative oil prices now. But they pay you to take it away. That's right. That's right. Uh, the stockpiles of crude oil now are full globally. There's been so much overproduction. And with the coronavirus, um, the level of production has significantly um, dropped, uh, and so there's just this huge glut. Um, so at the moment, as we can see, um, the charts themselves are reflecting a crude oil price of um, twenty-one dollars. But I think Canada. I'll just uh, I'll, I'll get this tweet up. It's very interesting. Uh, yeah, I think, I think it's um, interesting because you know this this could happen with silver or gold or any other commodity. Um, you know, there could be some new technology that comes out that makes mining cheaper or simpler, and it, it could happen on 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 anything. Yeah, that's that's what um, what Rich's trying to say by going to a, a longer look back period. You take in more and more of those um, differences in market conditions, and and the idea with this would be not to st once it's developed, not to stop here, but just to keep reiterating, you know, every six months or thereabouts to keep track of what's going on, but always going back to grab as much data as you can to try and pick it up so that it may not perform super great in the best times, but at least it'll it'll keep you out of the mess when it, when it is flat. So by optimising, mm. uh, I don't know if you've done it yet, Rich, but uh, if you ran the, re-ran the optimiser for um, XTI with that, what sort of result would you get there as opposed to what you've currently got? Oh, look, I haven't done it. Uh, so the idea being is that the optimization will run from 1985 up. So what, what's going to happen, therefore, is with the, the iteration and optimization process, this will be factored in. So the, the negative drawdown of this zone here uh, will be uh, deselecting those strategies that produce that 60% drawdown. So if I go back to, if I go back to here, you'll see that uh, we had a 66% drawdown for the bow, the breakout technique. We had a 61% drawdown. Now, the good thing is, even though we had these very high drawdowns, we're not dead. Um, have a look at it now. Um, we survived an extended period, you know, 20, 30 years. And at the portfolio level, it was we, we didn't see it, uh, but it was there. Um, and that's why you need a diverse portfolio for this degree of protection. But... You know, that was a 20 year period, 20, 30 year period of deteriorating drawdowns. And see, this is this is another thing. Um, what we're doing here is this market selection. There is no hindsight selection here. We are assuming that any market liquid market trends, we're not selecting preferable trending markets. We're using all of them because you need to recognize that whatever decision you make about which market you trend, it could do this. This is a possible outcome.
Um, you don't know. We don't know for, because we, we can't predict where things are going to go, but it might occur. But we know if it's under a diversified comprehensive portfolio, the impact of it is likely to be negligible. I'll turn these back on. Um, here's a... Okay, so that was the, the little cr crude oil. You can show us an article, mate. What happened to the article? Uh, uh, well, yeah. I didn't want to have to subscribe to Bloomberg. Oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, look, uh, the idea of it is uh, the uh, an area of the US oil market has already seen negative prices. In an obscure corner of the American physical oil market, crude prices have turned negative. Producers are actually paying consumers to take it away. Wow. <laughs> Sounds like negative interest rates. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, it, it, it defeats my whole thought process that commodities could never go to zero. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. blown that principle go. away. But, you know, usually what happens with commodities is that when commodities get low, the producers all get together and restrict supply, so they go back up. But clearly Saudi Arabia on their war mission with Russia um, want this to continue. <laughs> And all, all else suffer. Well, they're going to drive them out of the market, probably, or trying to. Oh, it's a, it's a nasty game. Uh, look, something also... Uh, now, as we've discussed, this is a very good result for the entire raw portfolio. No treatment has been applied here, and I'm wondering about the need to actually undertake any form of treatment. Because uh, as soon as you start talking about treating the portfolio that starts getting into that nebulous world of is that hindsight bias you're applying there but what i thought i'd do is just show you what happens with a risk management tactic um so we can see the individual drawdowns of each of these systems as we go down this column now at the moment every one of these systems uses a 0.5 percent trade risk on equity so there is a principle we could apply here to say, let's manage this drawdown exposure based on what the data has shown us. And let's reduce our position sizing, not increase it. So we, we, we don't want a situation where we start upping our, our returns. What we want to do is we want to manage our risk. So I prepared this matrix here that when I apply it as a a, a dilution factor to our 0.5 percent trade risk we then uh, the net result is just calculating now is to eliminate all of those drawdowns with at a greater than 20 percent drawdown by diluting um, the risk applied to that solution so as opposed to a 0.5% risk on this particular system here, we now do a 0.25%. Notice how I haven't gone to one or two. Um, I'm going down from 0.5. I'm managing my risk. But look at the overall result now in terms of a Ma ratio. We've gone from about, I think it was uh, 38, 0.38, up to now 0.59 by this risk treatment here. Mm. So I don't know, Barrett. What do you think? Do you think that's curve fitting? Um, no, you, you're just following, uh, you're just analysing the data and, uh, you know, adjusting your risk on the the portfolio level, which I don't think is curve fitting at all. I think it's, it's a perfectly reasonable exercise and assumption to perform. Yeah, I've got, I've got my doubts. And, and the reason I say that is we've, We've spent a lot of time getting to this point, and our starting premise was let's let's start with a fixed percentage risk on every trade we place, and we ended up with a curve we didn't like, so we, we're adjusting it. So to me, that mm -hmm. that's got an element of hindsight bias in it, and I'm not sure that's the right way to go. Yeah. So uh, the the assumption here is that. Um, uh, our trading would be going forward from this point, using this data history as a method to make our decisions. So my thoughts are we're using from 1985 up to current day and we're about to implement a live portfolio. So that history that history of the market condition is is telling us something. That's what, that's what I'm thinking. But I, I don't know, Fred, it's a, it's a tough one. It is a tough one. You know, the other thing we spoke of, Rich, and... 
I was probably not across it yet, is that at the moment we've we've said let's try and pull out the best five EAs to give us the um, the best mail we can from our our approach, and that to me again is trying to shoehorn our result into a one size fits all, and I'm not sure that's the right approach. So. <clears throat> but the thing we were going to try and do is uh, open that up and say, rather than limiting it to five, let's set the parameters so it can self-select anywhere between one and 20. The testing mm -hmm. we've done yeah. suggests that on average we'll end up around five or six, but at least if we, if we again let the data drive the outcome, then we'll get a, um, a, a potentially less shoehorned approach. And so then... I don't know, and, and adding to that, the fact that we're going to iterate back from 1985 to current day, I'm wondering whether these drawdowns start to go away, Rich, because the, the, the reality is our drawdowns are, are being generated in the time that's out of sample, is it, is it not? Yeah, that's right, mate. Look, uh, I think what, what we've got to understand is that the result we're getting, I'm going, to, I'm going to revert this back to what it was. The result we're getting, just at a raw portfolio level, I just want to show why we shouldn't be disappointed with this. What I want to show you is um, the, I'll just get it, won't be a sec, gents. Okay, so this, this is the um, performance result of uh, the professional trend following funds, um, most of them are CTAs of the world. So the composition of this is the likes of um, Transtrend, the likes of the Superfund Group, the likes of, um, uh, oh, look, there's so many of them, um, Mulvaney, uh, ISAM, uh, Dunn, Drury, Eckhart. So it's a big big index here. This is their performance since 1985. Um, I'll just get it back again. I'm just going to take a snapshot of this. I'm just going to put it over here. Now I'm going to take that away and now I'm going to superimpose that here. Look at these figures. So as an industry grouping, these top performing funds from 1985 to current day produces a compound annual growth rate of 18.39% with a maximum drawdown of 43%. Look what we've achieved with this raw solution without any treatment. 0.48 MAR, 24% drawdown, 11% CAGR. Let's say we wanted an equivalent drawdown to the um, S&P 500. At the moment, our drawdown is 248 I'm going to go to a 10,000 initial start. And you can see that uh, we've now got an 18% compound annual growth rate with a maximum drawdown of 31%. Let's bring that back into the context of this picture. 18.39 maximum drawdown 43. 18.44 maximum drawdown 31. Now remember this, these funds of course are based on uh, net results after performance fees, management fees. But just what I want to demonstrate to our forum members and to people listening to this video is that you could either go the approach of allocating your, your monies to these fund managers who produce these results. But when you look at the level of allocations needed for these particular programs, for instance, to get into um, TransTrend, for instance, the minimum investment, I'll just have a look at the minimum investment. Uh, let's look at uh, the, the standard risk portfolio. Oh, well, I actually just got it there, sorry. sorry. I'll just come back. This is the minimum investment. Some of them you need 25 million, 10 million, 10 million. So these are out of the ballpark of what a retail investor can do. So you won't get access to these funds and this level of diversification as a retail investor. So really what we're saying is that that's why you want to become a member of our forum. That's why you want to learn how to do this yourself. Because with your own skills and using, using your, the, these well-worn techniques, you can generate this yourself with diversified systematic solutions. Now, if, for instance, we had this solution going from 1985 to current day. We, we started with 100,000. 
we'd be sitting, if this these results are valid in any shape or form, we'd be sitting on about 6.4 million nest egg now. Now, this is something that a 30-year-old or a 25-year-old should be seriously thinking if they've got a, a small amount of money tucked away. Do it yourself. Do it yourself. You just learn the skills. Skill yourself up. Do it. Uh, what What's the, the breakdown of the instruments that all these funds trade? Is it uh, as diversified as they're, they're, what they're, or is it mainly yeah. futures? Or? You'd, you'd have to go into it, but when you go into, I'll go into, say, uh, let's go into Dunn. Um, if I go into Dunn, their World Monetary Agricultural Program, um, and when you look at uh, which the, they're in the future space, um, down here you'll see the composition. They, they've got 26% in fixed income and interest rates, stock indices 21%, grains. This is their breakdown of the sectors. Each one is fairly different, so that they all focus on offering a slightly different um, proposition to their allocators. Uh, that's how they achieve a slightly different correlation, because uh, these guys are looking to get allocation from the pension funds, that sort of stuff. So they want to offer a degree of non-correlated relationship with their standard portfolio. Um, they're all offering a slightly different proposition, but we're achieving a similar um, result here, even though at the moment we want to obviously go wider than this um, universe we've got here. At the moment, this is only about 12 markets with um, system diversification. If we go to 20 or 30 markets, provided we can still trade the micro lot, we can get very wide diversification exposure and we certainly can pull in very justifiable, good, solid results over the long term just going back to the the process originally uh back at the beginning you were optimizing over the entire data set weren't you and then it kind of switched to an in sample and out of sample period uh, and, and now you and initially we um we had a much um, shorter um optimization range so we're working on the, the philosophy that surely optimizing over the more recent market conditions means that um, you'll get bigger bang for buck uh, going forward provided you've honed it for more recent market conditions uh, what 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 we have found that that crude oil was a very good example is well um, with the trend following, it, it might be applicable to mean reverting systems that are using the principle of an oscillating condition or something that has a finite life. You do, therefore probably do want to optimise over the shorter time range to ensure that that principle that you've optimised on continues on. But when you're looking at trend following, which is few and far between, uh, you've almost got to go the other way. Very, very wide optimisation range horizon. This is, this is something that Rich and I keep banging heads on because um, it's the difference between long-term investing and short-term cash generation. And I think at the moment we're, we're opting towards the um, capital preservation approach rather than the cash generator. But there's nothing wrong with trying. And, and, and really, you've seen how much time it takes to generate the data and to come up with these results. So we can't do everything and right now we're trying to do this but i think once we get through all this then we might start looking at the shorter terms and seeing if we can't generate some cash flow out of this as well i know you've experimented bar up in mean reversion land what are your thoughts well yeah it's um i definitely say the mean reversion is the uh the the better way to or the more consistent way to generate uh, cash flow. Generally, I trade a, a Bollinger Band uh, mean reversion um, strategy. Yep. And yeah, it'll be interesting to see because you've already got the the breakout trader, which uh, it's a it, that's a bit more. Uh, like you said, with the the fixed profit target, it generates and it takes a lot more trades than the donkey. And so it's generating a bit of uh, cash flow in the shorter term already. But it'll be interesting to see if 
you can uh, compile, you know, in the tra trend following bunch of systems with some sh maybe shorter term or at least mean reverting uh, systems and see how they compile into a portfolio. I think system diversification really does offer, offer some opportunities. And so, yes, we need to look at those for sure. And in fact, we were, we were working on a Bollinger Band trader, which I'm not sure whether it was going to be a trend or reversal because I was looking for both using the Bollinger Band as a breakout and also for a mean reversion signal and letting the data again speak. But we just parked that for the time being because we got ourselves knee deep into this one. So we thought yeah. let's, let's work our way through this first. I've, I've got to follow. I've got to. I've got to follow you guys. But I, I must s stress my ardent disagreement with you both regarding mean reversion. <laughs> I, I think that is a. To me, um, mean reversion is a compromise. Um, I, I actually think we can achieve what we want out of life by using simple divergent positive skew. That, that's the only way to handle, uh, you know, the future uncertainty as far as I'm. I can see it, but but I'm following you. We'll let the data speak for itself and see what it says. Exactly. All right, guys. So uh, look, what else is there to talk about? I, I think we've gone through a good session tonight, um, mate. Barrett, it was lovely having you on board, and I think we might have to do this a bit more frequently, mate. Yeah, it was great. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, send the invite along, and I'll be sure to join if you want. Love it. Love it. Yeah, thanks, mate. It was good to get your input. A pity Richard speaks so um, eloquently that we didn't have a chance to even get involved, but that's all right. <laughs> oh, them, them thanks, fighting man. words, Fred. Okay, <laughs> gents. Well, thanks very much, guys, and um, take care, everyone. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a nasty market at the moment, so just keep your powder dried. <laughs> See you, guys. See ya. Rich, thanks, Fred. Right.